Good to see you guys here. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews tonight. We're going to be talking about a clean conscience, a clean conscience. As we are celebrating things that are being accomplished, I got a report uh, on Walk in Truth Radio. And if you didn't know, if you're fairly new to us, we do have a radio program that airs in several different states. And uh, it does air here locally on KKLA, uh, 4 a.m. and 10.30 p.m. So twice a day on KKLA. So we kind of get that really early audience and those late night listeners as well. Sometimes they re-air the broadcast sometime around 1, 1 1.30 in the morning, and it's pretty cool to see what the Lord's doing. I just got a report. We expanded out into podcasting in addition to radio, and we have now had podcast downloads in 100 countries around the world. Just to give you a small taste of that, in the United States, we've had 205,000 plus downloads of the messages in India, over 10,000. Canada, over 2,300. Singapore, over 2,300. Over 1,400 downloads in the Philippines. In the United Kingdom, 700 plus. New Zealand, Panama, Mexico. Um, there's some pretty significant numbers in Belgium, in the Russian Federation, Nepal, Costa Rica, Brazil, and on and on it goes. Uh, close to 700 downloads in Ireland. Um, Thailand gets some listens. We have a lot of countries where there's under 10, like Zambia, Peru. I don't know what's going on with the Italians. Only eight downloads in Italy. <laughs> what's going on with my people, my paisans? Anyway, so, but it's pretty cool just to see what podcasting is doing. And somehow, you know, either somebody travels and knows about us or they, they come across it somehow. And it's really exciting to think about, you know, people in these uh, different countries listening to a radio broadcast and hungry for the Word of God. So that's very, very exciting. Second thing I want to say before we jump into the message is, you may or may not have heard, but yesterday, Dr. Charles Stanley passed away at the age of 90. Uh, Dr. Charles Frazier Stanley went home to heaven. He lived in faithful obedience to God teaching others to have an intimate relationship with Jesus, reading from one of their releases here. And now he is receiving the joy of his soul, seeing his Savior face to face. Dr. Stanley was the senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Atlanta for more than 50 years. He was also the founder of In Touch Ministries and a New York Times bestselling author, having written over 70 books. Uh, something about Dr. Stanley that always struck me is he came across really much as a gentle, almost like a Southern gentleman, I guess you might say. Uh, and one of his famous ways of communicating and keeping your attention was, now listen, now listen, now listen. And uh, I will tell you that I was very much impacted by Dr. Stanley over my years, uh, especially as a, a newer believer. I got a hold of some of his books. But I, I remember one moment that will probably forever be on my mind and heart. During the COVID crisis, I think Dr. Stanley must have been 88, 87, 88. And he was interviewed and the interviewer asked Dr. Stanley, have you ever seen anything like what we're going through around the world in your ministry of close to 50 years? And he said he had not, that it had been a very unique situation with the COVID crisis. And I watched Dr. Stanley in his late 80s get down on his knees in front of his congregation, but most importantly, in front of Almighty God and, and cry out for healing, pray for our nation. I, I've seen him on multiple occasions, and I tell you what, it's brought some tears to my eyes to watch a man who's been that consistent for that long uh, humble himself before God and cry out on behalf of others. And I will say this, while all individuals are imperfect in one way or the other in terms of, you know, those who stand behind pulpits and preach to others. I will say that Dr. Stanley was a solid witness for the gospel for many, many decades. And I know he touched probably many of your lives as well. If you're a younger believer, you may not know about Dr. Stanley, but um, he has made a significant impact really all around the world and uh, through a television program that has impacted many lives as well. So we want to honor Dr. Stanley tonight. We are going to be in Hebrews chapter 9. 
Uh, I'm going to read just the last portion of the verses. We're, we're going to tackle a little bit more. We're going to look at the first 15 verses of chapter 9. We're talking about a clean conscience tonight. Uh, if you're able to stand, stand with us for the reading of the word. I'm going to pick it up at verse 11, just so we can get some of the verses under our belt before we jump in. So Hebrews 9:11 reads this way. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place, Hebrews 9:12, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, and here's the title, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Verse 15, for this reason, this is kind of a bridge verse. He is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Father, thank you for these verses tonight as we look at the Day of Atonement. We look at the greater fulfillment of the Day of Atonement in the ultimate high priest, Jesus, who through his blood, his death, his resurrection secured eternal redemption. Thank you for eternal life in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for a clean conscience tonight. And if some are troubled in their conscience, I pray that tonight would be a freeing experience as they celebrate the effect of their salvation, which is eternal life, but it's also peace with God and even peace with ourselves. Help us to embrace those truths tonight. Guide us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to be faithful to the word and be those who act upon it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. A clean conscience. What can wash away my stains? What can wash away my sins? I wrote in my notes, we need the detergent of heaven. And uh, as we've been learning together in the book of Hebrews, the symbols in the ceremonial sacrificial system pointed the way. They were the shadows that would lead to the ultimate substance, which would be found in Christ. And if you've ever turned to the book of Exodus or Leviticus or some of those books, you do see the sacrificial system with the shedding of blood and animals dying and stuff like that, and people laying their hands on the head of a goat or on the head of a bull, and you're like, what is going on there, and what does that mean, and how does that point to Christ? Well... There's a lot going on there, but one thing that we're going to focus on tonight, a little bit different, is the idea of a conscience. A man consulted a psychiatrist. He complained, I've been misbehaving, doc, and my conscience is troubling me. The doctor asked, and you want something that will strengthen your willpower? Well, no, I was thinking of something that would weaken my conscience. (laughs) That's supposed to be kind of funny. No? Anyway. Albert Speer was once interviewed by uh, ABC about his last book. He was on Good Morning America. Speer was the Hitler confidant whose technological genius was credited with keeping the Nazi factories humming throughout World War II. In another era, he might have been one of the world's industrial giants. He was the only one of 24 war criminals tried in Nuremberg who admitted his guilt Speer spent 20 years in Spandau prison. The interviewer referred to a passage in one of Speer's earlier writings. He said, you have said that guilt can never be forgiven or shouldn't be. Do you still feel that way? Now, this is a guy who worked with Hitler, obviously responsible for a lot of people dying in a brutal way. Do you still feel like guilt can't be forgiven? The look of pathos on Speer's face was wrenching as he responded. I've served served a sentence of 20 years, and I could say I'm a free man. My conscience has been cleared by serving the whole time as punishment, but I can't do that. 
I still carry the burden of what happened to millions of people during Hitler's lifetime, and I can't get rid of it. This new book is part of my atoning of clearing my conscience. The interviewer pressed the point. You really don't think you'll be able to clear it totally? Scheer shook his head and said, I don't think it is possible. For 35 years, Speer had accepted complete responsibility for his crimes. His writings were filled with contrition and warnings to others to avoid his moral sin. He desperately sought expiation, says this author, all to no avail. The idea of a conscience is actually mentioned many times in the Bible, and if you did a little search on it, you can find the word, and the word is in our Greek New Testament, and the word actually comes to us at, from Latin. If you look at the word conscience, it's two Latin words. It's the word con, C-O-N, and the word science. The word con in Latin means with, and the word science, you all know, means knowledge. And so the idea of a conscience means with knowledge. It's just simply that. And so when a human being talks about conscience, Here's what we do know from biblical revelation, that God has written his law in our hearts. And the book of Romans chapter two, if you wanna just write this down, we won't go there for the sake of time. Verses 14 and 15 of Romans two talk about the conscience in this way. Paul says that your conscience will either excuse you or accuse you. So we all know that maybe before we were ever introduced to the 10 commandments, we all had this sense of right and wrong, and scholars would point out that that's probably more the Imago Dei. That's the fact that we've been written, we've been uh, made in God's image, I should say, and his law is written in our hearts to some extent. And so we have an internal witness that Romans 1 talks about. We know there's a God, and we know there's a moral lawgiver. Now, we might not have been, you know, like wherever you come from, the Jews obviously were given the moral law on tablets of stone. But our conscience is something that God has given us. And scholars are quick to point out, <clears throat> sorry for my voice tonight. Scholars are quick to point out that your conscience can be muffled and seared. It can, be, it can get so bad. You can violate your conscience so many times that you can either muffle its voice or sear it with a hot iron. That means like it would be almost eliminated from you. And we've watched some people's, you know, maybe movies about people or, you know, that kind of thing where you, someone seems to have no feeling anymore. And you're like, that, that, you know, we say a sociopath, right? That person doesn't seem to feel guilt or remorse. And that's a pretty rare thing for most of us our conscience has gotten our attention for most of our lives. And if you, you know, think back to days when you were little, if you had a sibling, I know me and my sister would get into our arguments. And I remember one time we kind of went back and forth and, and I did something a brother shouldn't do. I kind of smacked her and I felt this overwhelming guilt uh, come over me. And I didn't need someone to read a law to me to know that that was wrong. And if you think about the Ten Commandments and you think about the moral laws, this is really what happens with us. We have a sense when we are doing right and our conscience excuses us and a sense when we're doing wrong and that's when our conscience accuses us. And something goes off in us. You can call it warning bells. You can call it a sense of guilt. And psychiatrists and those who study the brain and study the impact of just how we talk to ourselves, our internal voice, our self-talk, and how healthy we might be. Say, most of the illnesses on the mental side can be connected to the conscience or guilt. And, you know, we often feel like, I just read to you the story of this guy Speer, and he's, you know, part of Hitler's regime and responsible for all these deaths and feels such regret and you know, probably in this room or those who may be, you know, watching this or, or will listen to this on radio or podcasting later, you might replay in your mind things that you regret from the past. And, and the question is, what do we do with those things? And how is it possible to get over them, to have a clean conscience, to start over? You know, um, when David sinned with Bathsheba, 
He tried to cover that up. And you remember, he got Uriah home and he tried to get him to sleep with his wife to cover up that it was, you know, the baby was from the adulterous affair and he wouldn't do it. And then things got worse and David obviously committed some great sin. And here's what he said in Psalm 51, two and three. You don't have to turn there. He said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. Now listen to this. This is a statement of conscience. And my sin is ever before me. Do you hear that? I want you to hear that in a different way. Because many of you have read Psalm 51 probably multiple times. Listen to his words. Wash me, cleanse me. I know my sin, it's ever before me. That, that's a way to say, I keep replaying regret in my mind. And here's what happens with a lot of our mistakes, and we've all made them, we've all sinned, we all fall short of the glory of God, is we don't sometimes know how to deal with them. What do we do with our sin? I remember a pastor said he was on a plane and he ran into a Muslim uh, gentleman and they began a conversation and they were talking a little bit about, you know, what they believed and, you know, Christian pastor and a Muslim guy. And so um, the Christian pressed the Muslim guy on the sin issue and, and he started to talk about Jesus being our savior and all of that. And basically um, it came down to this. So the, the pastor asked the man, what are you going to do about your sin? And he basically responded, well, I hope Allah will forgive me on that day. And he said, can I ask you, where are you headed now? And the man was honest and he said, well, I'm on my way to sin. And he was going to meet a lady that was not his wife. And somehow he got seated next to a Christian pastor and the issue of sin came up. And he was honest. He said, I'm going to sin. I'm traveling. I bought a ticket to go in sin. And the pastor said, well, your honesty is refreshing, but can I ask you on that day when you stand before God, what are you going to do about your sin? And that's, this is where most people say, well, I just hope, right? This is, this is what we do. I just hope that God will forgive me. But you're on your way intentionally to go sin right now. I know, I know, but I hope, <laughs> right? And then somehow they come up with this, oftentimes uh, a self-produced system where they think maybe, you know, this will happen or I'll, I'll somehow get off the hook or whatever. But we all know. We all have a conscience and we have perception of right and wrong. We do things with knowledge. And the question is, what do we do? Is it possible to, to have a clean conscience? Is it possible for that part of my life to be cleansed? When David cried out to the Lord, that's what he was saying. He was saying, what, can these stains be washed? David knew that even in the sacrificial system, he should have died because he committed adultery and murder, which were punishable by death. So what did David have? He says in that psalm, if you remember, if there was a sacrifice I could bring, I would bring it. But that's not what you want. And then he went on to say, then I'm going to present a contrite heart and I'm going to pray for mercy. And God did give mercy to David, but he did not lift consequences from David. And I'll just say this, whether you know, you're David in, you know, in the Old Testament times or you're in the New Covenant, you are a forgiven person tonight if you're in Christ and you can have a clean conscience. But if you mess around, God may not remove consequences. Amen? So... That's what's going on here with some of these ideas of conscience. Now, in verse one, and we'll move quickly through these opening verses because the author intends us to do so. He's not gonna spend a lot of time here, nor are we. I just wanna show you in verse one of chapter nine, the word now connects us to the last verses of chapter eight. David brought those to us. Let's just read them together. He was celebrating the new covenant as compared to the old, and he said, Hebrews 8.10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and will write them upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord, 
for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Now that's the new covenant that supplants the old or the old is obsolete now. And God remembers his mercy and forgets our sins. Praise God. He remembers his mercy and he forgets our sins. Now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. The word now connects us to those closing verses in chapter 8. And the writer has said that in 8.13 of Hebrews, if you just take a look at it, this is an important concept to get down. Hebrews 8.13 says, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first what? Obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete, and I want you to notice it seems like it's a, it's a done deal, and then he says whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. And David pointed out rightly last Wednesday that Hebrews dates around 64 AD. In six years, the whole temple precincts and all that went with it were going to go down. Titus Vespasian's coming in with his Roman armies and they level the temple to the ground. Not one stone is left upon another, which Jesus gave a prophecy that that would happen. And we're going to study that when we get to Matthew 24 and our studies on Sunday mornings. So the old covenant was obsolete, but the Jewish audience, the Hebrews that received this letter, what was their great temptation? to go back to the temple, back to the sacrifices. And the temple was still standing, but in six years, it would be gone. As if to say, there would be nothing to go back to. So you need to know, and I think some of this language makes sense when you have that in the back of your mind, that that temple was about to go down in six years. So I think the author is saying this, look, what you are tempted to go back to is ready to disappear, Hebrews 8.13. The, the old covenant is obsolete. It's been supplanted by the new. And even the structure that represents the old covenant, as glorious as it may be, that is the temple which took the place of the tabernacle, is ready to disappear. And it did disappear. It's gone. And even today, if you go to Israel, it ain't there. What is there is two Muslim shrines sitting on what people think is the Temple Mount. Some people think it's just below in the old city of David. But wherever it may be, it's somewhere in that immediate geography. And if you see pictures of uh, Jerusalem today, what you will see is two Muslim shrines. And it's the Dome of the Rock, which is the golden domed one. And then the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the holier of the two in the uh, Muslim religion. And that's the one with the black uh, roof, but there are two Muslim shrines sitting there. There is no temple. And from 70 AD, when that temple was destroyed by Titus Vespasian, it's never been rebuilt again. And I know in a lot of end time scenarios, people are excited about a temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem and sacrifices coming back and all of that. But if that did happen, it would be meaningless in the sense of salvation. Because that system has been supplanted. It is now obsolete. So if for some reason a temple does go up in Jerusalem again and Jews start sacrificing again, animals and so forth, it would be meaningless in this sense. It would have nothing to do with people's salvation because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats and lambs and whatever you want to add to take away sin. Amen? So we might get excited because we think, well, maybe that'll trigger some last days stuff, and I won't argue with you there, but I'm just going to say this, that if it does go up again and sacrifices start taking place, it will be irrelevant to the status of one's soul. In fact, I would say it would be offensive to God when he sent his son to be the fulfillment of those things, and then we go back to the shadows, because that, that has been supplanted and disappeared. So the first covenant had all of these regulations and it had an earthly sanctuary. And, and the writer of Hebrews has gone to the tent, the original tabernacle structure, not the temple, 
But remember that they're basically the same thing. The temple became the permanent structure. The tabernacle moved around with the children of Israel. Once they had the temple mount, which David secured, then the physical stone structure was built. Now, let me just remind you, if we can throw up a picture of the uh, tabernacle. And let's leave up just the uh, one of the inside, just for a second. Well, just stay there for a moment. Go back to the first one. So remember, just to remind you guys, when we studied Exodus, this is kind of what it looked like as they moved around the wilderness. And as you entered in what's closest to us, you entered in the gate, single gate, one way in, one way out. First thing you came to in the outer court is the bronze altar where sacrifices of animals took place. If you were a lay person, you can't go beyond that altar right there. That's where you offered your animal. The priest took it and offered it on the altar. You don't go any farther as a lay person, a non-priest. That's as far as you can go. If you are a priest, the bronze laver was for your washing, not a lay person's washing, a priest washed in the bronze laver. And then you could enter into the holy place as a priest because there were regular things that you would do, like daily stuff. And then the Holy of Holies is on the, the back side of the temple, or the I should say the tabernacle inner court. So go to the next one just for a second. So we'll leave this up for a moment. So when you go into the inner part of the tabernacle, these are the furnishings that the writer will highlight. Now let's just read together so we can see how he hits on these. And He's going to tell us he's not going to spend time here. We've just gone through Exodus, so you guys should be experts on the tabernacle. For there was a tabernacle, 9-2 of Hebrews, or a tent, prepared, the outer one in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread or the showbread. This is called the holy place. Now, we know that each of these elements or furnishings pointed to Christ. The table of showbread, he's the bread of life. The menorah, he's the light of the world, etc. The altar of incense pictures the prayers of the saints, but also the intercessory prayers of Messiah. I won't go back through those. If you're interested, we did much in-depth teaching on the tabernacle, and it's available on our normal uh, places. Behind the second veil, Hebrews 9.3, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies. Now, that was the holiest place of all. In the Greek, it literally reads holy of holies. That might sound weird to us, but it does mean the holiest place of all. Having a golden altar of incense. If you have a New King James or King James, it says the golden censer. We'll come back to that. And the Ark of the Covenant. Now, that's the famous piece of furniture behind the curtain in the holy of holies. And that's the Ark of the Covenant in the very back where you see the glory cloud coming down, the uh, angels' wings touching, and so forth. That's the top lid of the Ark is the, called the mercy seat. And that description is actually a description of Jesus. He is our mercy seat. He's the fulfillment of that um, whole scene there. Within the Ark of the Covenant in Israel's history, they placed Three things. If you want to play trivia with your friends, ask them this question. What was in the ark according to the book of Hebrews? Three things. They put a golden jar holding the manna inside of it. They had Aaron's rod, which had budded, which represented the high priestly ministry, which flowered ultimately under Christ. And then they had the tables of the covenant or the Ten Commandments. So these are the things that were within the actual ark there are some verses that seem to have them out of the ark or maybe next to the ark, but at one point, these things were placed either inside of it or right next to it, and that's, you know, it, it doesn't have a huge significance, but I will just say this, the, the, the jar of manna was preserved to remember what God had done th during the 40 years to provide the manna every day. Aaron's uh, staff that budded was a reminder of many things, including the flowering of the high priestly ministry. And of course, the Ten Commandments should be obvious to us, right? Uh, written by the finger of God. And then, of course, they had to be redone, etc., because they were thrown down one time. And above it, now he's moved us into the Holy of Holies. Above it, the chest where all those things were, the, 
the lower part of the ark was the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat or the lid but of these things we cannot now speak in detail and some of us who are real serious Bible students might go oh bummer come on I want to hear the author of Hebrews you know expound on these things but he doesn't do it because that's not his purpose here he knows that his Jewish audience knows these things really well and I'm confident that this group knows them very well because we taught through Exodus and we, we went through this multiple times. Notice how his focus is into the Holy of Holies and he comes right to the mercy seat. He's taken us into that place. Now, when these things have been thus prepared, all of the preparation that goes with this system, the first covenant, if you will, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle they could go into the place where the table of showbread was and so forth. And they were performing the divine worship. Couple key words. They were continually performing. These are key words because it never ended. The people kept sinning and they kept having to do their job day after day, night after night. But into the second uh, holy place, or you could say the holy of holies as we've talked about, only the high priest enters, and that once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people. Let's park there just for a second. I mentioned to you that the, in verse 4, the altar of incense, you may have noticed that the altar of incense is just outside the curtain into the Holy of Holies. So you, do you see its position? Menorah, table of showbread, altar of incense closest to the curtain before you hit the Holy of Holies. It seems like the author of Hebrews doesn't know where it belongs because he says it's inside the, the Holy of Holies. What's going on here? Well, in the King James and the New King James version of the Bible, they call it the golden censer. Now, here's what a censer was. A censer was you would take like a bowl you would put like charcoals in it. You would sprinkle incense on top of it. And you could carry it around. So you, you could think of a modern illustration where someone's carrying around like burning incense. Let's just say they held it in their hand like this. And incense is puffing off something that they're holding. On the Day of Atonement, if you go back and study Leviticus 16, you'll see something interesting. The high priest on the Day of Atonement, on Yom Kippur, once a year, he took a golden censer entered into the Holy of Holies with the golden censer, left it there while it puffed smoke above the mercy seat, and he went out and he did a second offering according to all the, that was prescribed on the, on the Day of Atonement. And it may well be that the author of Hebrews is saying that the golden altar here, which is translated that way, I think, in every other modern version except for King James, New King James, the altar can be translated censer. It's only used once in the New Testament. I don't want to make more of this than it is, but you may have been curious about this. It may well be that the author is talking about what happened on the Day of Atonement with the censer and not the altar of incense outside the curtain. Everybody with me? But then scholars say this. But if that's true, why didn't he mention the altar of incense? Because he seems to skip over it. He mentions the the menorah and the showbread, but not the altar if he's talking about the censer. Everybody with me? So when you go back and study Leviticus 16, just to paraphrase, here's what's happening. If, if it's correct that it's a censer, the high priest did take that into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, because remember, he can only go in there once a year. I want you just to imagine that. Just let that sit before you. Imagine that you could only come to church once a year. And some of you are saying, that's exactly what I do. <laughs> we met those people on Easter Sunday, didn't we? That, that's their groove. That's what they do. All right, I'm not trying to be mean to anybody. But imagine you could only have communion once a year or pray once a year or open your Bible once a year or sense the presence of God once a year. That would be terrible. You know, right now, we often say when we pray, 
We, we can enter the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus anytime, 24-7, right into the holy place I go and I have the ear of my Father. I can be as near as I want to be. I draw near to him. He, draw near, he draws near to me. I don't have any barriers in my way. But in that day, one man, not multiple people, not a whole team of priests, one man, once a year. So, Think about how that limits not only the amount of time that it can be done, but the individual who can actually experience it. It's only one man. And he gets to do it as long as he lives until he dies. And then another guy gets to do it, but it's only one man, only one day a year. I want you to think of how significant that is if you're a Jewish listener and you realize that something radical has happened in this new covenant. When Jesus dies on the cross, one significant moment around the events of the crucifixion is the tearing of the veil in the temple from top to bottom. What does that signify? From God to man, the way is now open. There's no more barriers. There's no more curtains in the way. You know, curtains can send a significant message uh, can't they? In a hospital, hopefully in your shower, <laughs> right? You have a curtain up, and what does it do? It, it's a barrier. It sends a message. There's something blocking the way. Well, if you were a priest and you were moving around, and let's say you kept the menorah lit because it was supposed to be kept lit day and night, or you changed out the showbread and it got changed once a week or you did something at the altar of incense, you might want to peer into <laughs> the Holy of Holies, but then you might not want to because you know what God said? If you do things according, not according to my ways, you did. You don't look upon me. You don't, you don't mess around with this Holy of Holies. And now imagine the radical shift that has taken place. You don't... We don't need that structure anymore. I know that structure was significant. I know you built your whole life around it. I know you came three times a year, all well, you know, uh, well-bodied uh, males who could travel and all of that. And you came to this shrine. And as significant as it was, the veil's been torn. The way is open for every one of us. You don't have to come from the line of Levi. You don't have to be in the right family lineage. You don't have to come with all the sacrifices being done the right way, with certain garments, a certain crown, a certain way. Make sure you've guarded your steps. You've all heard the stories about how they tie the rope to the foot of the high priest. Those are not in the Bible, but we've, we've got a few of them from history. Just in case he died, they want to try to pull him out because nobody else want to go in there. Right? Can you imagine the confidence you must feel? Yeah, tie, tie it real tight, you know, just in case something goes haywire in there. <laughs> right? I mean, this is what they had to deal with it. And, and while it was holy and it was instructed by God, it still was very, very much sending a message. Don't tread here and don't come in the wrong way and don't come in if you're the wrong dude and don't come in at the wrong time or you're dead. And now, in the new covenant, what's happened? The way is open. Male, female, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, we all come through Jesus Christ into the Holy of Holies. Amen? Amen. See, when a, when a person who received this letter in the first century hears this stuff, I don't know if we can fully grasp the leap that this is, the significant bounds that this does. And so notice, into that second uh, inner place, the Holy of Holies, he entered once a year, not without taking blood. He had to make a sacrifice for himself and his family first, then for the nation. That's when he left that incense uh, censer in there. He would go back out, then do it for the nation, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people. Would you notice, it says, the sins committed in ignorance. I was on a radio program on KKLA some years back and we were a, a pastor's panel and a guy called in and he said, you're all wrong, you all got it wrong. It's always a wonderful way to start off a question, right? He wasn't really asking a question. He said, you guys are preaching about things you don't even know of because the only sacrifice in the Old Testament was for unintentional sins. 
Sins that you committed unintentionally in ignorance. Write this down for those of you who are interested. Read Leviticus chapter 6, and you will see what I see there is offerings for intentional sins like lying and stealing and being called to the carpet and acting falsely. Some say that what is going on in this mention of unintentional sins is high-handed sins. This is what R. Kent Hughes says, and he's talking specifically about sins of ignorance. And most scholars will put this under limited efficacy. So they're saying um, even the Old Testament sacrifices, we would argue, were largely symbolic, but even if they cleansed you temporarily until you blew it again, they were only for sins unintentionally committed. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had my share of intentional sins and unintentional ones. Anybody else want to say an amen to a negative? You know, amen says, I agree. That's what it means. We agree. Yes, that's right. So when you say amen to hard truth, you're very spiritual. I just want you to know that. You're totally, you just got it going on. Yeah, amen. That's me. <laughs> right? So here's what Hughes says. He says, and he, he quotes Numbers 15, 30 and 31. He says, these are sins anyone, and he's referring specifically to Numbers 15, 30 and 31. Sins de- committed in defiance, literally high-handed sins. And it goes on to describe the, the person that commits them. And then it basically says, if, if that's you, your guilt remains on you. And that is a orthodox position to take, and it may well be right, that the only thing that the ceremonial system was actually dealing with was unintentional sins. Think with me just for a second. David commits that sin with Bathsheba. What can he do about it? Can he offer a sacrifice? Well, there's nothing in the ceremonial system that's going to expiate or cleanse you from murder and adultery. You're, you're done for. You should die according to the law. Now, David doesn't die. He just cries to God for mercy, and he says, would you wash me from that? Would you cleanse me from that? Because I can't get rid of it. It's bothering me. And of course, God is gracious with him. It may well be there's another option here that I would just want to put before you. This is not necessarily anything to be dogmatic about. But these could be sins that you didn't do a sacrifice for during the year. So think about it. That, this area was always something was going on in the outer and inner court. Okay? Animal sacrifices uh, going on all the time. People would come in. <laughs> this is what I did. And sacrifice, sacrifice. But what if you forgot? What if you didn't make a sacrifice for one thing you forgot to get a sacrifice for. Now what? Some of us do this with our confession. We say, well, I know that confession is part of my prayer life. Let's see. What did I do in the last 12 hours? Uh, let's see. And we might think, oh, if I forgot, well, then I didn't confess that sin, so then I'm not forgiven of that sin. And that's kind of how a worshiper had to think in these days. There had to be a one-to-one correspondence between sins and sacrifices. This is why the author keeps saying, do you see what's happening here? Over and over, animal after animal, and they're not going voluntarily. <laughs> the animals are dying left and right, up and down, for all the, the mistakes of the people. And this system just keeps chugging year after year, day after day, week after week, month after month. And then you come to the Day of Atonement. And you know what the Day of Atonement is supposed to be? The day when the national sins get cleansed And the priest, he makes that offering for him and his family. He sprinkles the blood and he he leaves that censer in there representing the presence of God, smoking up. He goes out and he lays his hand on the head of a goat. One goat gets slaughtered for the sins of the nation. Another goat is called the scapegoat. And off he goes and 
We've heard the stories about how that works. Now he's doing it for the nation. And when everything was done right, the people waited with bated breath. It's the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is when we get cleansed. This is when everything falls together. Hope he doesn't die in there because, you know, there's a lot at stake. And I hope that goat that went off into the wilderness doesn't turn around and try to come back home, you know, with all the sins of the people. Oh, no. Right? And they had a provision for that as well. They would actually kill the goat because the goats started coming back. Just like that pet you've been trying to get rid of. It was probably a cat. But anyway, no, never mind. Different story. Sorry. I know that always causes issues. Could it be that the sins committed in ignorance are things I forgot about and didn't get a sacrifice for? Possibly. Again, I'll let you do a little further study on that. But everything is coming to this. The writer has taken us to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That's what he's done. And he said, I want you to see the day and I want you to see how much better the new covenant is. And it might be something like this. If you read between the lines, which would you prefer? You want to come in through the blood of Jesus or you want to go back to that? Not knowing even if everything's been taken care of and knowing deep in your heart that even if you participate in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, guess what happens? You're probably going to go out and blow it within a week and you're going to need to bring another sacrifice and another sacrifice and another. And sadly, some of us, and, and perhaps, you know, if world religion can do this to us, that's how we live. We live in this constant cycle of wondering, am I okay with God? Are my sins dealt with? Where am I going to end up when I die? Go, go out into the community and ask people, if you died today, where do you think you'd end up? See how many of them have the right answer. I, I bet you you're going to find that a lot of people are going to say, I hope. You know, I, I sure hope so. And that's not where we want to be. But even, even a, a Jewish worshiper at this time would probably be there, right? I hope. I mean, I hope the animals have dealt with my sin or whatever, you know. That's kind of what the system created. Now we're going to have to move quickly because we're pretty much out of time. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, Hebrews 9, 8, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while or as long as the outer tabernacle is still standing. Now remember, it was about to be obsolete. The temple was going to be destroyed, which is a symbol. It's symbolic for the present time or age Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper what? Perfect in conscience. Here's the thing. They come, they approach, they do it right, but their conscience is still wounded. Bunyan described it as a wounded conscience. And since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, that is the old covenant stuff, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Oh, isn't that beautiful? The time of reformation means when things would be straightened out, when things would be cut straight, reformed, put into their right setting. This is what the new covenant did. And then our verses that we read at the beginning. But when Christ appeared... I can't help but think of a holy night. Then he appeared and the soul felt its worth. You see what's going on here? Then Christ appeared. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under this system. Do you see it? When the kindness of our God appeared, Titus 3, I think it's verse 4. He saved us, not according to the works that we have done, but by the washing of what? Regeneration. Do you hear it? The washing so that I could be clean before God. This is Christianity's message. You and I can be clean by the blood of Christ. Praise the Lord. This is the message of the gospel. Your conscience can be cleansed. 
your soul can be right with God, Christ appeared as a high priest. He wasn't like Aaron or any of these other priests. He had the Melchizedek priesthood, of course. He was a high priest of the good things to come. That's the new covenant. And he entered through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not the one that Moses made or not even the temple. It wasn't made with hands because it wasn't of this creation. It wasn't earthly. Jesus went into heaven, into the ultimate holy place, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. Some people think he carried his blood into the holy of holies, the heavenly holy of holies. I don't think we need to push it that far. I think it's just saying through his sacrifice, he fulfills the imagery. He entered the holy place once for all. You don't have to keep doing it over and over and over again. Once for all. And what did he obtain? Eternal redemption. You know, redemption is a word to be purchased from the slave market, to be bought with a price, to be set free. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer. There's a lot of talk about a red heifer. That's in Numbers 19. It it was used, the ashes of the red heifer were used to create kind of like a holy water that would cleanse people if they defiled themselves. That's why it's a big deal, the red heifer, but that's for another time. Sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify them for the cleansing of the flesh. They do something either temporarily or on the outside. How much more? Will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, what does he do? He cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In Christ, my conscience is cleansed. And yes, I still need to protect my conscience and have it be informed by the word of God. But in Christ, I don't have to carry guilt around anymore. I don't have to wonder where I stand with God anymore. If I've done enough sacrifices, if I showed up in the right way at the right time. I'm not talking about easy believism here. I'm talking about knowing the Messiah. And if you know him, your conscience can be clean before God. In fact, it is. He's no longer counting your sins against you. Paid in full. Thank you, Father, for this section of the book of Hebrews. Thank you for the imagery, the sacrificial system being fulfilled and now obsolete. Thank you that once for all, for all time, Christ paid the ransom price and we are free. If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Thank you, Father. We're free in Christ, free to be who you've called us to be. We don't have to be under the weight of guilt, false guilt especially. We don't have to be under the weight of a conscience that may be misinformed and not according to the gospel. And we know you do convict us at times. But if you convict us, it's simply because maybe we need to amend something. It's not to condemn us. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation. Thank you. Your son was condemned, so I wouldn't have to be. Your son took the curse, so I wouldn't have to. Your son shed his blood and rose from the dead to impart life and that more abundantly. Keep your heart bowed. If you're not sure you understood the gospel in this way, or perhaps you have somehow strayed away, he would call you home, call you to himself. And if you're watching via live stream, or you happen to be listening to this at some later point, you know, he is a prayer away. He wants you to trust him. Trust what he accomplished for you. You can't add anything to his perfect redemption. But you can receive it. You can reach out for it and grab a hold of it. You can repent of trying to do it on your own or trying to serve two masters and commit fully your life to him. 
and watch what he may do as you become an ambassador of the good news of the new covenant in Christ. Amen.